About two years ago, Mourinho said, Give me all the old men. Cristiano Ronaldo, Lionel Messi, Drogba, Lampard, Terry, Ramos, Boateng, Dani Alves, Neuer, Modric and Iniesta. I would win the league, the Champions League and the FIFA Best Coach of the Year with them. The internet loved this quote. Some fantasized about some billionaire making it all possible. Drogba and Terry even made sure to say they were in if the plan was to go ahead. But some, some doubted Mourinho, which surprised me, since Mourinho has done this already. He literally won the Champions League with the oldest team to ever play in a final. I don't think people realize how much of an achievement this was. When Mourinho arrived at Inter, they had not won the Champions League since he was two years old. That's more than four decades waiting for the trophy, made 10 times worse by the fact their city rivals AC Milan had won it 6 times over that period, being the most successful team in the whole world. By 2008, Inter had gotten more desperate than ever. Mancini had been at the club for three years, they had won the league three times in a row, in part thanks to the Calciopoli scandal, and it was clear to everyone they were the strongest team in Italy. It was the kind of dominance they had not experienced since the 60s when they last won the European Cup. But despite all of that, internationally, Mancini brought them disappointment after disappointment, three consecutive last 16 exits, which, surprisingly to many, led them to be sacked and replaced with Mourinho, who had just left his empire at Chelsea following disagreements with Abramovich. Mourinho once said, the most important thing when you get to a club is establishing what the club wants, and from there on out you work your hardest to make it possible. Inter wanted to maintain their dominance of Italian football, but also to do their best in the Champions League. Looking in between the lines, you can see the club thought that winning the UCL was an impossible dream. Anyone would have just laid back, made a couple surefire signings, taken one or two more Scudettos and moved on. But there's a reason they say Mourinho is special. He told them that winning the Scudetto was a given, and when it came to the Champions League, it was simple. He was going to use the first season to get a good feeling of how the team faced a challenge like that, and by the end, he would have a report for them on exactly what they needed to win it. Step by step. So rightfully, as that first season started, he didn't need to go crazy in the transfer market to shake things up, he was a disruptor himself. First of all, he let go of some dead weight. With Solari's contract expiring, he let him leave to Argentina. The same went for Recoba, who had been loaned out to Torino. And when it came to the actual sales, Mourinho barely moved the finger. Not a single starter was sold that summer. However, on some messier back and forths, Adriano was brought back from his loan at Sao Paulo following a stretch of good form in hopes that his struggles with alcoholism were in the past, while Hernan Crespo, who was already on loan at Inter, was signed permanently after his contract with Chelsea ran out. Finally, when it came to the few purchases he did make, they were mostly just reasonable transfers, except for Quaresma, who was the exact opposite, with Mourinho risking it all, making the prodigal son of Portuguese football his most expensive transfer of the season. Besides him, Mourinho signed Montari, who had impressed him by being a center figure in Portsmouth's fairy tale run towards an FA Cup title, trying to add some speed and strength to his midfield. While on the other hand, his other signing Mancini from Roma was brought in in hopes he could add a bit more goal threat to their midfield. Though, that transfer seemed to be a reaction to the fact that Mourinho's number one request and obsession, Frank Lampard, ended up going back on his word and deciding to stay in London when the deal was 99% done after getting the news that his mom had passed away. Mourinho would go on to call that the biggest disappointment of his career. And yeah, that was pretty much it. The team was assembled. But one thing stood out to everyone. Their age. Just looking at the players who got regular playing time. In defense, Cordoba was 32, Walter Samuel 31, Materazzi and Zanetti, the captain of the team, were both 35 years old and it didn't get better higher up the pitch, with most of their midfielders being over or very close to 30, with Figo already at 36 years of age. While in front, though Ibrahimovic was just 27, the secondary striker role was rotated between Crespo, who was 33, Julio Cruz was 34 and oddly enough Mario Balotelli who was 18 years old. And honestly, in that first season as much as Mourinho insisted their experience would only work in their favor, things didn't go so well. Sure, domestically they dominated once again, but in the Champions League, with the exception of Anartosic, Inter fielded the oldest starting eleven in the whole competition and you could tell the players weren't getting any younger. From fitness issues to full-on injury plagues, at one point Mourinho was left with no centre-backs available. And with this added to their dependence on Ibrahimovic's goals, 
having to rely on Balotelli as their second highest goal scorer, saw Inter going through the group stage with only two wins and then being defeated by reigning champions Man United in the round of 16. I wouldn't blame anyone for questioning Mourinho at this point, except for Montari, his moves in the transfer market were pretty dreadful. Adriano rampantly left the club following another mental health crisis, Quaresma was voted worst transfer of the year, and Mancini was already warming the bench only months after arriving. And even though they would go on to break the record for most wins in a Serie A season and take the league title once again, in reality it just felt like one more season without any progress. But well, behind the scenes, Mourinho had been working on that famous step-by-step -step plan on how to make Inter an unbeatable force. And as promised, once they were out of the Champions League, he delivered. The report went like this. We have the best low block on the planet, but our center backs are slow. We need a fast center back who can carry the ball and help them press higher up the pitch. The number one name on the list, Ricardo Carvalho. Mourinho had him at Porto, he had him at Chelsea and he would eventually have him at Real. He's simply one of the greatest center backs of all time and one of Mourinho's right hand men. However, Chelsea knew how great he could be under Mourinho and they did not budge. So he went with a plan B. Lucio from Bayern Munich. Though he could sometimes go by unnoticed, he was an exceptional player. A world champion with Brazil, extremely reliable, hardworking, and even if he wasn't as technical as Carvalho, like Mourinho said himself, he was really, really fast and an absolute bargain. Literally just 7 million. In attack, things got more complex. Obviously Mourinho loved Ibra, but the way things were set up was problematic and with Guardiola coming at him with full force in the transfer market and claiming Eto was problematic and a bad influence to the younger players, Mourinho realized the opportunity he had and just went along, trading one for the other and getting 48 million as well. When asked about it, he said, For me, this was the deal of the summer. This is worth 100 million to me because trust me, Eto'o though he's not worth even one euro less than Ibra. And even with all that money coming in, he didn't exactly splurge on a partner for Eto, instead signing Diego Milito from Genoa for only 28 million. The guy had been scoring a goal every 100 minutes throughout the last season. He was easily one of the most underrated players in Europe, and to me this was simply one of the greatest signings of all time. And finally, the last note of the report. As much as players like Zanetti, Montari and Stankovic could dominate any team physically, Mourinho believed Inter needed to improve the technical quality in their midfield, to find someone who could control the tempo of the match from the back, as well as someone to keep them in control on the ball, the kind of player that could seemingly hold on to it forever. So to fix the first problem, they raided Genoa once again and brought in Thiago Mota. Smart, with great vision, he could freeze a game at any moment. It was perfect, but the final piece of the puzzle only became available in the last week of the transfer market. With Real going on a massive buying spree, a few players were left on the sidelines, waiting for someone to pick them up. And among them was Wesley Schneider, who joined Inter for just 15 million and added that bit of magic that made it all possible. Add to this the departures of Maxwell to Barcelona, Julio Cruz and Crespo were out of a contract, the retirement of Luis Figo, and well, the fact that all players were now a year older, and Mourinho's Inter had almost reached their final form. In the words of the man himself, they were cynic, intelligent and pragmatic, a team that could find a way to beat anyone in Europe. That was Mourinho's promise. At first he deployed them in a 4-3-1-2, which neither being put into the starting 11 before he had even attended a single training session. And the result was a 4-0 thrashing of AC Milan. They looked scary. But then, in the Champions League, despite wide belief they would now perform much better, all Inter managed was three consecutive draws, not even managing to beat the likes of Robin Kazan. The problem was relatively obvious. Their formation was quite simply too narrow, and with the rising popularity of attacking fullbacks, they were allowing the other teams far too much space on the flanks. And it was right after going behind in their fourth group stage match against Dynamo Kiev that Mourinho finally gave in. Changing to a 4-3-3 or 4-4-1-1, bringing out the midfielder in favor of Balotelli and convincing Eto'o to drop to the flank, where he would be forced to cover a more central defensive pocket, always waiting 
for the chance to go on the counter. This was Mourinho's eureka moment, with 4 minutes left on the clock, Milito drew the match and in the final minute, Schneider put them in front and kept them in a race for the knockout stages. Following a defeat to Barcelona, which greatly hurt Mourinho's ego and a win in the final match of the group stage, Inter had made it through by an inch. But it was all worth it because Mourinho now knew what to do and with the market open, he made one single transfer and it was... Again, just genius. Knowing Balotelli could not be relied upon neither consistently nor defensively in that winger role, he brought in Goran Pandev from Lazio. It was a classic Mourinho signing. You could put him anywhere on the pitch and he would get the job done, which was so perfect for that role exactly. However, this change in formation worked so well in the Champions League it almost ended up hurting them, since it just wasn't as effective domestically. In fact, it got so bad at one point they only got 5 wins across 15 matches, nearly allowing Roma to take over at the top of the table and leading to rumors that Mourinho's job was in risk. Can you imagine? Regardless, it stuck with it and eventually it clicked. Though, to be fair, it only did after Mourinho began constantly making inflammatory comments about the referees, convincing the players the world was against them, which only further motivated them to conquer it. It seemed they just needed a little bit of luck and they could pull off the miracle. Instead, every draw seemed like the worst case scenario, but Mourinho only saw that as an opportunity to prove that his teams really were the best at dealing with unfavorable scenarios. The first of those facing Mourinho's old team Chelsea in the round of 16. The champions of England, including Carvalho and Lampard, these two failed signings, and his coach Carlo Ancelotti, an ex-AC Milan player. It was a challenge, a serious one, or at least it should have been. Instead, it served more as their first battle cry. Beating them 2-1 in the first leg in Milan, and then beating them in London as well, with Mourinho telling the press before the match that he never lost at Stamford Bridge and it wouldn't be any different this time. Quite simply, iconic. Following this came the most straightforward round of the tournament facing CSKA Moscow and smoothly making it past them with two 1-0 wins thanks to goals by who else but Milito and Schneider. And here's where things got really serious. The next team they would have to face would be Barcelona. Mourinho had reason to despise them. They were the last team who employed him before he became a coach, being always undermined, referred to as simply Bobby Robson's translator and given no hopes of ever having a chance at coaching, no matter how much Robson vouched for him. They were also the team who allegedly robbed him and his Chelsea side of a spot in the Champions League final and above all, they were the team who just two years prior to this match rejected him after he approached them looking to become their new manager, instead signing an ex-player with no coaching experience. Pep Guardiola, who would go on to win the Champions League on his debut season while deploying the second youngest starting eleven in the competition. He was the anti-Mourinho and it was time for revenge. It all started with that infamous quote. We have a dream to win the UCL. For Barcelona, it is not a dream, it is an obsession, implying they felt inferior to their rivals in Madrid who had won it so many more times than them, and also implying they would do anything, even cheating, to win it all, which was more of a stab at UEFA than anything else. Right before the match started, he would tell his players, there are winning teams and better teams. You will play against better teams, but if you remember that, you will be a winning team. Mourinho would go on to describe the first leg as a game played with the head more than the feet, and that was exactly what it was. With the volcano halting air travel and forcing Barcelona to travel to Milan by bus, Inter played smart, letting Barcelona hold possession and punishing them at every minor mistake they made, and of course, rightfully, the most cunning player on the pitch, Diego Milito, was the star of the night, assisting two and scoring the final goal as Inter won 3-1. Regardless, 
This meant nothing. The world was convinced Barcelona were by far the better team and they were more than expected to make the comeback. Which became a million times worse when 28 minutes into the second leg, Thiago Mota hit Busquets in the face, being sent off with a second yellow card. His face showed nothing but desperation. After all, as Mourinho would say, to play for an hour with 10 players against a team like Barcelona in a stadium filled with 100,000 of their fans should be an impossible task. However, Mourinho was never one to just give up. So in that exact moment, he ran towards Guardiola and whispered in his ear, You think this is over? This is far from over. The mind games had begun. First part of the plan, block their game. Teleto and Pandev to move deeper into those half spaces than they ever had. Second part, cage Messi. Tell Zanetti and Cambiasso to not let go of him for one second. Press him so hard, it will feel like torture. And above all, let the clock run. Telling the team they will have the ball much more than us. But the thing is, they still can't hurt us. So let them have the ball. And once they think they're in control with their fullbacks way too close to our box, dash into those counter-attacks like your lives depend on it, Puyol and Pique will not be able to hold you off without support. Barcelona averaged 73% possession. They needed two goals to go through. Pique scored the opener with only six minutes left on the clock. And then Boyan scored to put Barca in front. But unfortunately for him, it was offside, and so a couple minutes later, when the whistle was finally heard, Inter were in the final of the Champions League. Modin rushed to the middle of the pitch, finger pointing to the sky. While they tried to stop him, the groundsman even turned on the sprinklers to force him out of the pitch, but nothing was enough. As Mourinho said, I have to thank them for the sprinklers. The water was needed to wash the blood, sweat and tears my players left on the pitch. This was the greatest defeat of my life. Now in the final, there was one last challenge. Van Gaal, one of the coaches Mourinho had worked for, one of his mentors, taking charge of Bayern Munich. Both teams had won everything, both fighting for that final trophy, fighting for the treble. The difference, only two of Bayern's outfield players were over the age of 30, while Inter presented the oldest starting 11 ever seen in a Champions League final with an average age of 31 years and 34 days. And like Mourinho would one day claim, that day he took all the old men and he won it all. 2-0 was the final result. Milito scored both and finally asserted himself as one of the best strikers of his generation. Schneider claimed one more assist and topped the charts, becoming one of the main candidates to the Ballon d'Or one year after being deemed disposable by Real. Eto had proven he was worth every bit as much as Ibra. Zanetti finally won the UCL after 17 years, and those old men got to celebrate like kings one final time. For the Interisti, Mourinho was absolute royalty. For FIFA, he was the best coach of the year. And still, to UEFA, he was nothing. They didn't award him anything. You can make your guess as to why that happened. But above all, nothing describes what made Mourinho special more than him getting out of his car right after the final and hugging Materazzi on the sidewalk, who, knowing he was most likely off to Real, told him he would never forgive him for leaving. And it's no wonder. After him, it took Inter 11 years to even win their next league title. 